Welcome back to the Role Player Podcast. We back with season two, episode three, with a, another new host. Uh, you know, we change your hosts a lot lately, but you know, we just trying to find the right one, and we think we we think we got a good one. We got my man Anthony Goods, a ten year pro and co and CEO and co founder of Swiss Cultures, also a Stanford alum. So you know that's that's we in the right ballpark now. So Ant, appreciate you joining us, man. <laughs> man, I, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. I'm I'm excited. No doubt, no doubt. And then also our guests uh, probably don't need introduction, especially from for the overseas crowd and the American crowd, of course, to the, the uh, modern day human highlight reel. Also nine year pro everywhere from the NBA to the Euro League with the Milwaukee Bucks and FS all the way to Ukraine. A three time champ, six man of the year in France, a college defensive player of the year. I don't even know you played defense for real. And also the highest, highest, <laughs> the highest, uh, Man holds the highest vertical jump in NBA combine history at 46 inches, if that's right. Has anybody broken that yet? Uh, I think somebody might have got a 47, but I don't, I don't know. I'll keep track of that stuff, man. I'm getting old. Man. All right, well, yeah, we, ain't, we ain't counting that then. But, no, we got my man DJ Stevens, University of Memphis, man. We appreciate you coming. Stephens, man. Stephens, man. Come on, man. Stephens. You running Stephens. off. You done ran off the full list, the accolades. You done said stuff I done forgot about. I done forgot all about the defensive player of the year award, all that. Did a man say the hey. simplest thing and get it wrong? Come on, man. Hey, man, I can't read that well for one. And also, that's kind of an ambiguous name. So that, I leave that up to Ant, man. He the reader, like I said, <laughs> stand for the love. So, man, but no, nah, we glad we glad you with us, man. Appreciate you taking the time out uh, to sit with us, chat with us. We kind of changing the changing the flavor up with role player podcast. We going with a little bit of more overseas news, and we want to we want to highlight all everybody that's playing overseas and doing their thing overseas. And allowing y'all to kind of talk about um, talk about the things that's going on overseas, you know what I mean? So we're gonna start with you. You obviously got a lot going on um, coming from playing in Ukraine this year, right? With Prom- Promete, since you pronunciation police, did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, you, you said it right. You said that I right. Said my name wrong, but it's cool though. I ain't gonna take All no right. All right, my bad. Uh, so yeah, so with Promete coming from Ukraine, y'all team. Uh, just to give a little background, on y'all team was one of the best teams in, in Europe, not only in Ukraine, but in Europe this year. Um, you was doing your thing, whole team was doing your thing. Obviously the war hit and and the team had to fold. Uh, so just kind of give us some more additional background for the listeners about, about what was going on with your situation as far as the war and the, and the team. Now it was, it was pretty crazy and uh, it all kind of happened like kind of fast. It was like, everything was cool. Like uh, everybody was was surprised in the summer with some of the signings that we had, like with D. Harrison signing, Chris Dow going there, because a lot of big names haven't really went to Ukraine. But last year I signed there uh, at the beginning of the season. Then I signed to come back this year. And then like a, a lot of other names started coming too. So then it like started picking up a lot more attention, like nationally across the, U- the U.S. and just the basketball world period. And then – once the season started, we playing well. We qualified for Champions League. We won the Super Cup of Ukraine to start the season. And then right after that, we signed DJ Kennedy and Miro Beeline. And those are those are two more big names. So everybody's like now the team and Ukraine are getting a lot more attention because of like all these these big name players going there. So we're running through the league. Uh, at the point that we stopped, we were 25 and 0 before we had to flee the country. Um, but all of a sudden we just started getting like my family sending me text messages, sending me news clippings, like worried, concerned, saying like the president saying this, like the news is saying that, like what's going on over there? Are you okay? But like, as far as like life in Ukraine, everything was just casual, normal, regular life. Like I go to sleep every night. I'm good. I wake up, everything good. So then after like a few days of my family like wearing this stuff, I start like hitting up the organization, trying to talk to my teammates, find out like what's going on. And then they like downplaying and saying like it's been a war here, like in eastern Ukraine for like the last eight years. So to them, like anything that's been going on is just regular to them. So it's not that big of a deal. But as time goes on, like the talks in the news and the media like it's getting bigger and bigger and you're hearing more and more like Russia's going to invade. So then like 
the Americans, we start chit chatting to each other and talking about it in our group chat or whatever. And eventually it gets to the point to where we start asking like more and more questions to like the higher ups, like the GMs, the head coach, the owner of the team. So eventually, like they say, like they don't think anything's going to happen. They just think it's just talks and political, political games and this and that. But we like, all right, cool. Then like more days go by. We like, you start getting a notification where Biden saying like, you need to, all Americans need to evacuate within the next 48 hours. We like, hold on, that sounds a little serious. So then like some of the, the Americans in the group chat, like, nah, I think it might be time for us to get up out of here or whatever. So we, uh, we hit up the coach, hit up the organization, trying to put more pressure on them to like devise a plan. Cause it was like, before that, the owner of the team, he was like, if anything happens, like, I'm going to uh, put you all on like a private jet and get you out of the country. If anything happens anywhere in Ukraine. So we like, we felt safe, but then like everybody around the league, they start asking us what we're doing. And it's like, I know other teams in Ukraine, they don't have the same kind of money that we had. So it's like their resources are limited and it's not going to be as easy. So I'm, I'm telling like a lot of guys that I'm cool with, like, like, I feel like, you know what I'm saying? If you don't feel comfortable, I feel like you should slide. Like, I really feel like you should leave or whatever. But then as time went on, I was telling them, nah, like, bro, you should leave. Like, no matter what your team talking about, I know you're probably thinking about the money and all this other stuff. I feel like you should just go ahead and slide and then just worry about that stuff later. So we started putting more pressure on our organization. And then it was like, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to move the whole team out of the country. We're going to play this last game. And then right after the game, the next day, we're going to leave, go to Czech Republic, and then we'll figure it out from there. So played that last game. Next day, we packed our bags. But it's like to them, they still thinking like it's not that serious. Like it's, you know what I'm saying? They thinking it's just like talks and this and that. So we think and pack our bags. We think in worst case scenario, I'm taking all my stuff because I don't know if I'm ever coming back. You know what I'm saying? So let me pack all these bags. So when we show up to the airport, we got all our bags. And they looking at us funny like, like, where are you guys? Why you guys have all these bags? And we like, hey, shit, we don't know if we're coming back. So we might as well just bring all our stuff. So we get to Czech Republic. We practice there a few days. Then we talk to coach. He let us go back to the States for a few days. So then everything cool, everything regular. We go back to the States, enjoying time in the States. Literally, I'm on my flight in the air coming back to Prague. I land in Amsterdam, and I got 50, 60 text messages from, like, family, friends, asking if I'm okay because Russia, like, invaded Ukraine. They asked if I'm still in Ukraine. They asked where I'm at, what I got going on. Then you start looking up all the news and all this stuff. So it's hectic. So then we we finally make it to Prague. They have a meeting with us. And they're like, uh, I know Russia invaded Ukraine, but they were like, everything's still business as usual. Don't worry about salaries, money, any of that stuff. Everything's okay. But it's like for us, it's weird because it's like you went from this never is going to happen. This isn't going to happen. So now it's happening, but it's like they're still casually going about it. And you think it's just something that's going to be like short-lived or something that's happening right now, but then over time it's going to go away. Nah, it was like it continued on for days. And then it was like it was kind of hard just being in the atmosphere because like, like my teammates, their families, like a lot of them, they brought their wives and their kids with them. But they couldn't bring, like, their parents with them. They couldn't bring, like, their, their aunts, uncles, grandma, grandpa, whatever. They couldn't bring them with. So they were still there. And it's like, you seeing all this stuff at the news. You're seeing stuff all on Instagram. You're seeing the bombs falling. You're seeing the gunfights. You're seeing all this stuff. And it's just like, you see them, and it's almost like they're zombies because, like, they're having to deal with all this stuff. Like, teammates are telling me, like, their families were sleeping in basements and sleeping in bomb shelters and they were sleeping in the middle of the night and then they just heard bombs going off and it's just like like this is chaotic and then like after a few days of that it like it started messing with me mentally because it's just like it's like it's becoming like PTSD for me because it's like that's all I'm seeing that's all I'm hearing about 
And then it's like, you got to be around your teammates. That's all they're talking about. You know what I'm saying? You see them, you see that they're struggling with whatever it is they're dealing with. So it's just like, it felt like a weird atmosphere. It's like, I don't feel like I should be practicing or playing basketball or dealing with any of this stuff right now. Cause it's like the team that I play on the team, it already represented Ukraine because we were a Ukrainian team playing the Champions League. But it's like now it feels like it's magnified by a thousand because it's a war going on in the country, but we still here playing basketball. So it was just, it was weird. I can't even remember the days because they kind of run together, but it was just like, we played that game. We had an off day. And then uh, the next day, the next morning, we randomly get a text saying team meeting just like random, abrupt, quick, like no warning, nothing. And they were like team meeting or whatever. So then we pull up in the meeting and some of my teammates, they were already downstairs and they're like, bro, it's over. I'm like, hold on, what you mean? He was like, bro, the owner just canceled the season. So I'm like, like, damn, what does that mean? So then we sit down, everybody don't even fully get in there yet. They just start explaining what's going on. And I'm like, yo, it's people still missing. Like y'all ain't even waiting for everybody to get in here. And they just started telling us, they're like, owner of the team said, like he decided to cancel the season. He decided to file force majeure, which I don't know if y'all know what that is, but I'm going to explain it for the people that's listening. It's like a, a, a law or something that's in your contracts that basically says uh, in the event of like a, a catastrophic event or unforeseen events or something like that, the team can file and they don't owe any debts or salaries or whatever to any of the players underneath these guidelines or whatever. So. This happened on March 5th. Payday for me was March 7th. So I still should have got my last check for March. Didn't get that. Then April, May, whatever. Don't know if I ever get any of that money. The owner of the team says he's going to pay it at a later date, like when the war is over with or whatever. But you know how stuff works overseas. I might not never see that money again. So it's just like you go from being in a situation where you're told, like, don't worry about nothing. Everything's going to keep running. As usual, you know what I'm saying? Everything's going fine. Then you go from that to now that money that was accounted for is gone. Then it's like on top of that, under the force majeure, the hotel hadn't been paid. So everything that hadn't been paid, it fell on the players, whoever was in the room. So, you know what I'm saying? We had to take care of that. Then on top of that, the flights home or the flights wherever you was going, that fell on top of us. So it was just, you go from a secure situation to just a chaotic one and all of what, the meeting last 10, 15 minutes? Mm. So it was like in 15 minutes, everything just fell apart. Then it's like all the work that we put in, going 25 and 0, being what, 37 and like four or five or something like that overall in the whole season, being on the verge of making top eight Champions League, you go from possibly, probably going to win the championship in Ukraine, probably going to win the cup in Ukraine, probably going to make top eight in uh, Champions League to nothing. It's like all that work we put in, all that stuff we did, it don't mean nothing no more. Like that's probably one of the greatest teams that ever played in Ukraine. It don't mean shit. And it's like for me, like as a basketball player, you know what I'm saying? You grind, you work hard to try to win championships and do other things overseas. And this was a special team. And then for all this stuff to go on, it, like it take a little something out of you because it's like like this was a special situation. It was unique. But it's like you don't even get to to experience or reap the rewards of what was supposed to happen in the season because of the events, which is tough. But I mean, I'm still processing some of it. But it's like now, like I'm okay. Like it's been a few days or whatever. Like, I'd have been able to move past it. But it's like, it's just weird. Because now, like me and you was talking before, uh, before we even uh, started recording the conversation, like three of my teammates that signed on new teams already. One playing for Bamberg, one signed to go back to Sassari, and the other one went to go back to Brindisi, or Brindisi, or however you pronounce it. So it's like, now I'm going to see them in different jerseys. And we was literally just together a week ago. So it's all just a weird situation. But, I mean, now... You know what I'm saying? As time's going on a little bit, it's allowing me to cope with it a little bit better. But it was just chaotic that first day. Oh, that's that's super tough, man. I think, you know, I think it's uh, 
it's obviously a lot to process, but I think it's just, it, it's tough because, you know, people's jobs and, you know, their livelihoods at stake. And then even going back to your career, like you never get this year back. You know, there's only a few special years. I mean, granted, you've won championships before, but I mean, you never get tired of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, when you got a special team and you got that bond, man, it, uh, you know, that really sucks that it has to, it has to end under these circumstances, you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, I mean, we're talking about war here and, you know, basketball is a game. Um, so, you know, there are people dealing with, uh, they got a, they got a lot, you know, deeper troubles, but, um, you know, from the, uh, from the athletic standpoint, man, it, it's really unfortunate though. Yeah. Cause it's like the last two or three years has been rough cause 2020 COVID hit. So that's like, you know what I'm saying, everyone the whole year. And like some teams still trying to recover from COVID hitting and stuff in that year. And then like a year or two later, now this stuff is falling on Ukraine. But it's like, it's like it's not even just Ukraine and Russia. Cause it's like everything that's going on with Russia and Ukraine is affecting the whole world. Like right. the basketball market all across Europe is slimming down. Like the VTB league is falling apart. Russian teams falling apart. So it's like a lot of that's going to change a lot of the way that the market is in Europe in this summer and uh, maybe summers to follow because it's like you don't even know if these leagues or if these teams are still going to exist or if they're going to have money or whatever. So it's just like it's just it's, it's changing a lot of things. So how do, how do y'all see this war changing the scope of like, let's just say like EuroLeague because, I mean, in EuroLeague you have some some big teams that come out of Russia – so how do y'all see that shaping out? Man, I mean, Ches Cheska leaving the Euro League is going to be the biggest, might be one of the biggest shockwaves that that we done seen in Europe in a minute. I just, I mean, they got the most money. They probably that's the highest paid team in Europe, right? Like, so oh, shoot, who are are you signing DJ right now? If you could go to Cheska, are you going to Cheska if they sign you? Like, let's say, I mean, nah. obviously, if the money is crazy, but like, or even if the money is crazy, would you go? Nah, it's like. Because of what's going on, I couldn't do it. Because, like, I first of all, I played in Ukraine this year, so what would that look like if I went and played for Russia next, or went and played in Russia next season? And then it's like, essentially what Cheska stands for, that's like Russia's army. Like, that's like the background of what the team is. So it's like, then you really, you supporting it like tenfold, but it's just like, I couldn't do it because in a sense, it's just like everything of what's going on. I know, like, the people in the clubs aren't the ones directly, you know what I'm saying, making decisions to support certain people or exactly what they're doing. But it's like if you trace the money back to somewhere, it's going to funnel back to Putin somehow, some way. So it's like I couldn't, you know what I'm saying, I couldn't receive the benefits or I couldn't be in that situation to support anything that was going towards that. But it's like, granted, I got guys that I used to play with when I played in Russia. I played was in it. Uh, in the first year that it was ever a basketball club. So it's like I got people that I'm cool with from Russia, and it's like they don't stand for what Putin stands for. It's like a lot of people in Russia, they don't even know what Putin's doing right now because he's controlling the media and what the what the citizens are able to see. And it's like the guys that have, like the younger generation that have access to like social media and all this stuff that are getting like the live feeds and they're finding out what's really going on, that are protesting this stuff. Like a lot of those people that are being thrown into jail or, you know what I'm saying, are being detained and all these other things. So it's a sticky situation and it's unfortunate because it's affecting so much more than just Russia and Ukraine. And it's way bigger than that. So I don't know. It's just a, a very interesting situation. Going back real quick, just to the, what you was talking about with the team folding, like, I don't think people understand finding a situation like you talking about, and we've talked about it off camera or whatever, Finding a situation like that in Europe, there's cats that play for 10, 11, 12 years that don't find that situation. So kind of that, like what you say, just to put in perspective for the listeners like that emotional, I guess, roller coaster that you just went on is crazy. And I, I remember that because I was I was in Lyon and I remember I loved Lyon. Like I loved it. And COVID hit when I was in Lyon. So that just shook mm -hmm. up some things. And I always remember my coaches, uh, Serbian coaches talking about they were in Ukraine when the when the war that's escalating now started talking about, oh, yeah, we'll be back to playing. They were comparing the war to COVID. And I was like, no, nah, I don't think this is like that. But, you know, that's, that's yeah. another story. But um, 
it's like just just getting in that situation and having things fold up like that is 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 wild. But that's all I just wanted to touch on that. But then as far as Cheska leaving, Cheska and all them Russian teams for again for perspective, Cheska, Cheska leaving is like the Lakers leaving the NBA. Right. I mean, yeah. especially the way, especially the way Euro League is unfolding right now and and trying to, I guess, move towards more of an American type model with, with TV, trying to get into TV and stuff like that. So that's pretty that's, that's pretty crazy. That's why I think yeah. I think it's really important for EuroLeague. Like you have to get another big name team in there, like a partisan. Partisan has to get a license now. You know, you need like a historic team, another historic team to replace Cheska. You know what I mean? With the big following. And like now you at least have, you know, that derby there in Serbia and stuff like that. But I mean, I think Partizan for sure has to get the bid now, especially with Abradovich there. Like, I mean, everything is just, you know, it looks like it's just an easy call, you know, with Cheska falling out. Cause I just don't see how Cheska is going to get, even if they're able to operate next year, like, Who's gonna go play there? I mean, you, you always gonna have some players that's gonna sell their soul, but it, it's a risk. It, it's a risk, man. Like you just never know what's gonna happen while you're there. And like you know, I'm mean, even with the Brittany Griner situation going on. Like I guess they don't really know where she's at, you know. And um, you know, there's a lack of communication there with her whereabouts. So you know, how much of that is political versus you know whatever the offense was, you know. So. Yeah. There's just a lot of risk for a foreigner being in Russia, you know, for the foreseeable future. And, you know, I hope I hope I hope it uh I hope a player don't don't put himself out there like that. That's that's, yeah, that's gonna happen. That's gonna happen. <laughs> you know, so it says somebody somebody say eight hundred one point two, somebody biting at that. Man. <laughs> that's a given. <laughs> it ain't even gotta be that. <laughs> right. <It's fact. laughs> It's interesting because we just talking about Cheska, but if you look at the Euro League right now, you still got Zanek that's in Euro League right now, Onyx. and you still got Onyx, yeah. And then it's like Hemke that was in uh, that was in Euro League. They used to be, but then they folded because they just ran out of money. I don't know how that happened because they went from having all this money to now you don't have any money. So that team folded. Cheska, Zenit, then Onyx. That's three teams that if they're not able to recover or not able to compete next year. There's three teams you got to replace, not just not just the Cheska. So it's like it's interesting. And then it's like the Brittany Griner situation is scary because it's like you don't even know if she really did what they said she did. It's like they the ones controlling the narrative. They're the ones that's controlling the media. Like if you you look at the information, it's very limited. Like what you see, what you know is going on. Like. People don't even know how long she's been there. They just keep saying last month. And yeah. March just started. So it's like, okay, she, she could have got there, what, February 28th? It could have been February 2nd. You don't know nothing. So it's like the information that you're getting is real limited. But I hope, hopefully, somewhere soon, like it's a a real, like, situation going on where whether it's our government and their government trying to communicate to to find a solution so that she can get back home because I already know that's probably chaotic for her. Not to just be in jail, but to be in jail in a foreign country and not just any foreign country in Russia, especially at a time like this. So I don't know. I'm just praying, you know what I'm saying, for her, for her mental, for her safety, because that's rough. It's definitely a scary time, man, but we're going to move on to uh, we, we got a segment called Paycheck Rain Check. And as you know, as uh, all of us probably know, I don't know if y'all been abused <laughs> like I've been abused overseas, but I got a I got a couple paychecks that the team took up a couple rain checks on. And I ain't uh, I ain't seen my bread. But, you know, I think, um, you know, with this segment, we just like to, you know, bring to light, you know, some of the uh, financial issues that are going on overseas. And, you know, as we've been speaking about during this uh during this conversation a lot of players in ukraine uh you know have lost their jobs and you know they're not they're unable to find new teams you know as, as you alluded to but you know my concern is some of the lower paid players like the other guys in ukraine you know that weren't on the top teams mm -hmm. and, and things of that nature like and that don't have a resume you know what i'm saying it's like uh mm -hmm. 
I feel I feel bad for those guys, you know, especially if they were having a good season in Ukraine and needed those statistics or, you know, whatever would have came from that season, man. I think it's, uh, you know, it's devastating for everybody involved, regardless of what you're making. But I think uh, especially for some of those guys at the lower level, man, this is a this is a huge blow. I mean, uh, even though those lower teams in Ukraine, they probably weren't going to get their bread on time anyway. Anyway, and now, <laughs> and now you give them a reason like COVID was a reason, and now they got the war. I mean, you never want to be in a situation really, like not even allow yourself to be put in a situation really, to where it could be a chance that your team not gonna pay you on time, and then on top of not paying you on time, you might not get all your money. Period. Because like as a younger player, I went, I, I didn't switch agents three times. Like, the agent I have now is my third agent. Uh, I fired my first agent after my first season. And, like, the first place I went was Greece. And at that time, even now, still, you know, if you go to Greece, it's a chance the payments is going to be severely late. <laughs> and it's a chance that you're not going to get that money that you signed for. So, for me as a rookie, I'm playing in Memphis. I'm playing in front of 18,000. We flying charter jets. You know what I'm saying? I'm getting all the gear. I'm getting all this, I'm getting all that. Then you go from that to playing for a low-level team in Greece where I'm getting my checks three weeks, a month late. I got a newborn at the crib. You know what I'm saying? I'm a new father. I'm trying to balance the life of, like, learning overseas basketball, like dealing with the struggles of that on top of not having my money when I'm supposed to get my money. And then, like, it's always blown my mind when I think about it because it's like the teams, they're the ones that drop these contracts. They say, I'm going to pay you on this day. I'm going to pay you this much on this day. You know what I'm saying? But they the ones that don't pay you on the days that they said they were going to pay you. So that never made sense to me. But ever since, like, I left that first year, I always made it a point to my agents or whoever to make sure you do your due diligence and don't send me nowhere that's known for late payments that – owes any players any money or anything like that. So I've been fortunate since then. I've only been in one other situation where I didn't get all my money. But it was cool because it was just like the year that I played with the Grizzlies for the majority of the year, then I ended up getting cut. I went to Bahrain for like two months, signed for X amount. I don't like throwing numbers out there. So I signed for X amount. I'm there a month and a half, and then – I wasn't playing up to their standards. You know, when you go to certain countries, mm. you know what I'm saying, they standards, the goalposts always going to move. You could be playing well in certain situations, but something go wrong, you lose a game, or, you know what I'm saying, things don't go exactly how they want to. The first ones is going to get blamed for anything, always going to be the imports. Me and my man that was on the team, we ended up getting cut. They brought in new players. And it was like, all right, you collected all your money up to this point, but everything after this, you're not going to get that. Even though it's in the contract and it's fully guaranteed, they like, nah, you're not going to get that, so don't even worry about it. So, like, that time and my rookie year was the only times that I didn't – well, I ended up getting all my money, but all the payments were late when I was in Greece. But that was the only time I really didn't get all my bread that I was supposed to. I lied. COVID year. Definitely didn't get all my bread. I was in France. Yeah. The government said they was going to pay whatever they said they guaranteed they was going to pay. And it was like the team got the option to pick up the other half. And the team was like, nah, we straight. Go on about your business. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I thought they, they told us, they told us every, because I was in France, you know, we was France together. But uh, they told us everybody got their bread that year. Every team, they lied to us. Man, bro. They was like, uh, they were, I remember, uh, you know, Antoine Etzo, he was on the, uh, yep. the Players Association. So he talking, he like, yeah. He was like, the the league is backed by the government, so we're going to get a good percentage of the rest of our money. But the team has the option on whether they want to pay the rest of the bread or not. And he was like, but I think I think Lamar, Lamar, great club. You know, I think they'll do it. But they was like, nah, <laughs> nah. <laughs> then I start, I start getting hit for charges for stuff, like damages to the car. You know how that stuff go. So I'm like, damn, I lost. So on top of the money that I'm not getting, now y'all finna try to find a way to take even more money out of my pocket. So I'm like, but I won a championship there. I still got a good relationship with the people in the front office. Still got good standing um, with everybody in all the places I played. Uh, but yeah, man, it's it's bad 
when you come over here, you grind hard for your money. You work hard for it. And you be in them practices in two days. You do all that, and then you don't you don't get all your paper when you supposed to. That stuff be stressful. Yeah, y'all people better y'all people better start coming on over here to Asia. Ain't you good? People know you. They know how to act over here. Just think got the Wi Fi, all right? <laughs> wi Fi a little shaky. Wi Fi a little shaky with the bread on top. Yeah, they, the money on top. They, they skim that on the expenses. The Wi Fi. Yeah, nah. <laughs> nah, but for real though, the, the Asian market though, with like we were talking about with, the, with Russia going down and the European, I mean, the European market been trending downwards for years as is. So, I mean, the Asian market, we'll see what happens with the G League. If they're going to start, you know, paying more guys up in that you know, six figure range or, or whatever, but it's, it's going to be real. It's going to get real interesting for basketball, for basketball players in general in the next five, 10, 10 years, what the landscape going to look like. No, nah, you were texting me about, Hey, you need to stop playing and come out here to Asia. Nah, it's like, it's crossed my mind. It really has. Like I've wanted to play in Japan because I, you know what I'm saying? Tokyo has been a place that I wanted to visit for a long time. So it was like, it's been something that me and my agent, we've had conversations about. But it's just, you know, it's not easy to fluctuate between, like, playing in Asia, coming back to Europe, and doing all that. So it's like, do I want to go to Asia and then possibly, you know what I'm saying, have to deal with having to try to figure things out or work on my way back in Europe if I need be or go over there, have a good career, and finish it out over there. I mean, I never know, so. I feel like Europe and Asia is like, it's like Target and Walmart. You know what I mean? They got the same <laughs> stuff, but you know, Europe's just branded a little better. You know what I mean? So everybody feels better. Like, yo, I'm going to Target. You know what I mean? But yeah. I think Asia is, is quickly, uh, is quickly gaining ground, man. And, and I think players are starting to wake up, man. And, uh, you know, go get paid. Cause at the end of the day, once you, once you retire, man, all that prestige don't give you a bonus. You know what I mean? You don't, and like we was talking about with the contract, you got what you sign for and you got what you take home. So that's uh that's really all that matters at the end. All that matters. I play, I would play my, they got a, in the ABA, they need to start that up. They start playing dudes over there. I play, I play wherever looking back on it. You know, I wouldn't be worried about EuroLeague or nothing like that. Mm -hmm. Shit, I mean, the NBA for real. Be yeah. thinking, I mean, obviously that's where you make the most bread, but. Speaking of which, we got two uh, cats around our age uh, kind of blowing back up. Hey, Stowski's younger than us, though, huh? Uh, but, yeah, two two cats uh, kind of, yeah, Stowski's like 2014, kind of reemerging in the G League. So just want to get your thoughts on uh, on Isaiah Thomas and uh, and Nick and Nick Stowski. I mean, you played in the G League, too, so you, so you know what it's all about. Um, and just kind of what you think about them. But they've gone for 40 several times. What that grind is like, why they're not getting a, a guaranteed deal in the league, um, especially two dudes like that who, who are established NBA players. Like, what's the what, what's your thoughts on on their on their situation and their grind? Oh, that's interesting. Cause it's like for me, I haven't I haven't understood why IT has been out the league as long as he has, especially with what he was doing before, you know what I'm saying, before the injury. And then after the injury. All right, cool. I understand you got your questions and your concerns, but at the end of the day, can he still do what he's been doing? But it's like with the NBA, it's like a, a situation where it's not always is black and white as it should be. Like it's a lot of gray area with the NBA. I feel like and it's like you're not always given your fair opportunities, or not as as simple as you being good enough to play in the NBA. Like it's a lot of politics and other stuff that goes into it. But for, like, both of them to be playing in the G League and putting up these crazy numbers, it's good for them because it's showing that they're still capable of doing all that stuff at that level. Of course, the G League isn't necessarily the NBA. I mean, I know it's under the NBA umbrella, but it's a little bit different. But I feel like, like, from what they're doing right now, I feel like they're both capable of playing at that next level again. It's just sometimes it's about timing. Some of it is, you know, like situational. I mean, that's anywhere, uh, whether it's NBA, overseas, or wherever. Like, your situation is going to determine a lot of what you can produce depending on who your coach is, like how much lease he's going to give you. Is he going to let you go hoop? Is he going to give you the freedom? You know what I'm saying? Give you the confidence to be able to just go out there and play your game? Is he going to try to control you? Is he going to limit your minutes? It's a lot that goes into that stuff. But I feel like what, what they're doing right now 
and with it being like a unique situation where because of COVID, a lot of guys are being able to get 10 days and get opportunities. I feel like it's a good time for both of them to show everybody that they're still capable of playing at that level. I mean, looking looking back at the numbers, I mean, Isaiah Thomas, he averaged, I think it was over like three games, he averaged like 41 and shot like 45% from three. And then Stout, Stout is, just went off. He had he averaged like 50 and uh, shot like 70% from three, which is crazy. Like, you know, for guys to do that repeatedly, you know, more than once, every dog has his day. But, mm-hmm. you know, once you start doing that two and three times, man, I think, you know, that statement has been made. But as you said, I, I don't think it is all as black and white as, you know, it should be. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, you throw those numbers on any other player in the G League, or on a 22-year-old kid, a 23, 24-year-old kid, they're going to sign him ASAP. It wouldn't even be a hesitation. And still only yeah. plan to probably have him two, three years, maybe. You know what I mean? And then yeah. they're going to try and use him as a piece. So. It's uh, it's kind of crazy how these how these things work in the league, like especially when they say like, "Oh, this player's too old" or whatever it may be. It's like everybody signing one two year deals anyway. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, so if, if they're able to produce right now, why not put your best that you got on the floor? You know what I'm saying? Maximize what they got going on at the time. But it's just like over over the years, like the NBA has just gotten younger and younger. Everybody's looking at everything like based on potential. And not necessarily what can he bring to the floor, what can he do right now. So it's like a lot of older guys are being forced out of the league, having to go overseas and do this and that when they're still good enough to play right now. So it's like it's interesting because it's like front offices have different views and different ideals or they're looking for different things instead of just looking what's the best team that I can build right now. But I understand they're investing a lot of money and putting a lot of time and effort into a bunch of different things. So they have to plan for the future as well. But I just hate that it's not more opportunities for guys that are capable of performing night in, night out, no matter how old they are or whatever. So to me, to me, what stood out with those two is uh, how much health matters. I think um, at the, at that, at this level, once you get out, once you, college once you get out of college for sure like I look at IT that hip surgery I've had that hip surgery twice so I know I know what that does to especially as a little as a little dude playing playing with bigger bigger guards and man it was crazy Stauskas was in uh, Spain when when we were in France and he had a knee thing mm-hmm. and he just he just wasn't moving the same so he must have got right because he, he moving a whole lot better so to me it was just it was just really it, it it really highlights how much health matters at this level. And I don't think people really understand that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Unless you, unless you really done lived it or you an athlete, but as far as, as far as more opportunities for, for other guys, you think as a basketball player, you think the NBA product has suffered in terms of, in terms of the quality of what's on the court, not to say, not to say the dudes out there can't play. I know all these dudes can play. And, you know, obviously you got all these old, they say these old heads are hating. So, can never turn into one of those, but um, you know, do you think do you think the quality of basketball, the style of play, is suffering? I feel like slightly, uh, only because like I'm a, I'm a true basketball player. Like I play both sides of the ball. Like I know the the objective of the game is to put the ball in the hole, but it's just like okay, you got people out there that want to stop those guys from being able to put the ball in the hole too. So it's like they tailored the game for offensive players right now so it's like okay they changed a lot of rules you can't hand check or you can't do certain things that's tailored for the offensive player and it's like in a lot of situations it's a lot more iso basketball versus like the style of, you know what I'm saying where you got to be able to play team basketball to generally be a lot more successful but it's like the NBA more open, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot more players that are capable of doing more things, so there's a lot more ISO possessions in the NBA. But I mean, it's still a good product. I mean, it's still the best league in the world, but I just feel like no doubt. over the last few years, it's suffered a little bit just because of certain aspects have fallen off a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, I would probably agree with that, you know what I'm saying? It's, uh, I think, I, I've always said that a lot of these teams would be a lot more competitive taking, like you said, the dudes that can contribute right away. 
you know, I think it, you would see you would see a lot less of these. I don't know. I don't know what that business model would look like exactly, um, mm -hmm. but I think you would see a lot. It's crazy because we, me and my teammate, we were just talking about in January. You always see a dip in in the play, like in the NBA. It just seems like there's a lot of blowouts. It's a lot of dudes that just seem like I don't want to say they want to be out, but they just tired. Like they, you know, what I'm saying they just mm -hmm. tired. The stars get tired, and I think sometimes when the stars come off the floor, um, some of these younger guys who haven't played a lot of basketball just struggle to, to struggle to compete. So yeah, it's interesting you say that. Yeah, but it's it's always been weird to me that not even just in in the NBA, but also in Europe too. It's like teams spend a lot of time getting their core group ready, but they don't – I feel like they don't funnel in enough of their young group and, like, get enough playing time so they can get, like, some experience so that, like, when it gets to that later point in the season, like you saying, or it's time for the playoffs, certain players, you know what I'm saying, that have a little bit of – you know what I'm saying, have a few reps and they'll be able to produce and perform in the playoffs or later in the season. I always thought it was weird that you don't – We'll see like more teams preparing like the younger guys instead they just sit him off season then okay he might get an opportunity if somebody get hurt he got it you just throw him in the fire go ahead all right now you got to go out there you got to play 30 plus minutes now and then you see what they can do but it's just to me it's just it's, it's strange how like a lot of these situations they work out and they pan out like even the situations to where it's like you'll see like somebody that was like uh, a 10, 11, 12 guy on the bench in the NBA, they'll leave that team, get traded somewhere, end up on another team. Now he's scoring all these points and doing all this stuff, and everybody's like, oh, man, he's really been working on his game and this and that. It ain't that. He's just finally been given the opportunity to play basketball, and you can see what this kid can really do versus him just sitting at the end of the bench like a lot of these teams have these kids doing or players doing, period. I think I think one thing they could do is and this is just me thinking off the wall here. I think if they let's say they put something like more lenient hand checking rules in the G League. So that way, when you're sending these young guys down, they're faced with a tougher level of defense. You know, what I mean, it's like you, uh -huh. you always hear like, oh, in Europe, it's harder to score and things like that. And I think a lot of it is yeah. because the, the play is a lot more physical, obviously, with the court being shorter. But, you know, in the G League, I mean. You know, I played it probably a decade ago, but, you know, as you guys know, it's, it's a lot of up and down. You know what I mean? The, yeah. They're not as tall. They're not as long. They're not as quick. But the rules are the same. So it is pretty easy to, you know, get some buckets in the G League or to get some open looks. So I felt like if they implemented harder rules that made it harder to score, at least at the G League level, then when these players get down, they're kind of getting like a, a tougher test. And now when you put them back up in the league, like, yeah, the players are bigger and faster, but, okay, without these rules now, you know, they can operate at a at a different level. So, you know, that's just something off the wall that I was just thinking about that might help some of the young guys develop um, a little faster because they are playing at a lower level in the G League um, to prepare them for when they come up. No, I was about to say, because, I mean, essentially, like, the G League is looked at as a similar situation like the NBA, like, it's about scoring numbers, like scoring points, putting up this, putting up that. So it's just like, what are you really – like nobody really plays defense in the G League like that. Like you might have your your select few of guys that are going to play on both sides of the ball, but if you ask a guy, like, what does he feel he needs to do to make it to the next level, he's going to tell you I got to score 30 or 40 points or something like that. And it's rare that a guy that – is a defensive stop or does this or that is going to make it to the next level from the G League by playing defense because it's like that's what they're looking for on the next level. So it's like, well, what's the point of me doing it down here if I need to score points to get to the next level? Yeah, that's facts. That's facts. And also, shoot, I, I like that idea. Any type, any type of rule change that helps development, I'm with now. And dudes go back up to the NBA, they go foul out in the first quarter, but <laughs> it's going to be tight on them. But no, I, I, I agree with that. I think, um, I don't want to say, <clears throat> I think the NBA almost has an obligation at this point, again, just bringing it somewhat full circle to make the G League the second best league in the world at this point. Like they're just 
there's no reason not to have all your best players at the crib with the amount of investment going into basketball right now in the NBA itself. Like, ain't, ain't no reason, honestly, like that. And, and I, would, I would say this almost the same argument little from a little different stance that the WNBA has is that there's no reason that, you know, DJ Steffens should have to leave, uh, should have to, <laughs> should have to leave Memphis and go to, you know, go to Ukraine to hoop to to make a living. You know what I'm saying? He should be able to get a get a solid amount of money playing right here. You know, whether it's with the Grizzlies or with the Hustle or whatever it is. So it's just something that hopefully hopefully it goes that direction. Um, but moving forward, uh, uh, last thing we want to touch on is uh, obviously with uh international women's day yesterday and somewhat unrelated but shout out all the women out there for international women's day and we want to talk about Kyrie Irving hiring a a, a female or a woman agent yeah just talking about the impact that might have on the agency or on the agent business um I guess get your thoughts on that um yeah her name is uh Shatelia Riley Irving she's Chetelia the first black, she's the first black woman agent in NBA history Dope. Well, I super dope. Her name super right, dope. but yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. We struggling with that, but no. Yeah, shout out to her, and uh, so just want to talk about get your thoughts on on that. And I guess is that something that obviously you're not going to say no, but is it is that where, where do you see women fitting in in the in the agency industry in the agent industry? Uh, me personally, I feel like it should matter whether they're like male or female, as long as they're able to do the job and do it well. You know what I'm saying? They should be able to get the job. You know what I'm saying? They should be able, you know what I'm saying, to fulfill certain shoes. They should be able to make the max amount of money possible. It shouldn't matter, like, whether it's a man or a woman. But I, I feel like that's huge for the furthering of women in that field and for them getting opportunities. But it's like me, like, I view life a little bit different than I did before because I got two daughters. So it's like I have to be – you know what I'm saying, an advocate for them. I have to support things that are going to help them for when they get older. So it's like anything that's going to advance, like, women in any sense of the world, whether it's the workplace, whether it's in sports, whether it's in, you know what I'm saying, whatever career fields they want to go into, I'm all for it. Because, you know what I'm saying, it's like, as a man, we don't think of certain, we don't think about certain things because it doesn't directly apply to us or it doesn't directly affect us so it's like certain things like like the the, the discrepancies or the inequalities between like women's pay and men's pay you don't really think about that too much until like you're around a woman and you hear her talking about it and then you think about it and you're like man okay so you hear her talking about it so then you start like trying to find out more about it and then you start hearing like how much like this guy gets paid compared to this woman and it's you're like well they do the same job. So what what's the difference? Like why does she make significantly less than he does? And it's just like a lot of things just don't make sense. So it's like you start understanding like once you, you start hearing about these things and you start finding out more and more about it, then you start trying to educate yourself and then just trying to, to be empathetic and then try to do things that you can to help improve or help get the word out there so that these situations can become better for the women now and better for the women in the future i think it's just it's important and it's uh it's also inspiring for you know a lot of other women and i think that's yeah. kind of the uh the huge thing i mean even when i was in europe i uh you know I, I knew some women in europe that were like crazy into basketball and you know really wanted to become agents and you know they're hesitant because they felt like they're not going to get the respect. And obviously Europe's a lot more traditional than it is, than it is in the States. But, you know, a lot of that is still present here in the States. And, um, you know, you can do the job if you got the connections and, you know, if you got a way of negotiating, I think mm -hmm. you can do the job just fine. I mean, there's plenty of women in, you know, uh, there's plenty of women in, 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 in regards to attorneys and uh in the entertainment industry you know i i don't see why they couldn't do the same in the uh in the basketball field as well but it really just comes down to them having these relationships and uh but you got guys that have never played an nba game before in their life and then they they grow up to be you know suitable agents so i, I don't see why a woman can't but I, I think it's super dope that you know Kyrie took this 
took this opportunity to to hire her. And, uh, you know, and obviously, you know, I'm sure he wouldn't have done that if she wasn't qualified. And, you know, now he's he's uh, kind of given her, you know, his platform. And uh, I think that's inspiring for the uh, for the next generation of aspiring woman agents out there. Yeah, no, I think I like that piggyback on that I think it's hella dope that Kyrie did that but then also I, I think it's important for for Chatelia to kind of to to pay it forward you know I think a lot of times when we talk about these things and diversity diversity becomes like the hot uh like the thing to say like oh we need more diversity like and I think diversity becomes everybody's involved but I think it's important for someone in her position to not be so concerned with diversity as much as be concerned with hiring other women um, and women who look like her and kind of just keep pushing that forward. I think the same as well as it, as it goes with black. I think black folks are get caught up in um, in diversity and hiring the best available person. But I think, you know, when you build in community and opportunities, I think you hire the people that are around you and the people that are, that are like you, that's kind of how you build a equity in a space, I think. And, you know, you obviously there's a ton of people who are qualified to do that. So, so that's, that's, that's all we got. We want to close it up, man. You know, we, uh, we started with, with all your situation. We appreciate you joining us. Um, you know, because we are an overseas centric podcast, we want to finish out with what is your, we want to hear about your favorite thing about overseas. A lot of times, you know, we hear all the horror stories about not getting paid and, you know, no Wi-Fi and, you know, all that and getting stuck this, that, this place and that place. We want to hear about, you know, what, what's your what's your favorite thing about overseas or maybe one of your favorite stories about being overseas? I'll say two. Like probably my my favorite thing about being overseas is being able to have the opportunity to go to a a new country, a place I've never been before, and just experience a new culture. And then in a sense, watch myself adapt to that culture in that time that I'm there in that country. Like Hooping, playing, traveling, doing whatever. Like, that's one of my, my favorite things about, you know what I'm saying, playing overseas. And then, like, my favorite memory, I probably have two, well, three. This past season uh, was pretty dope before all the madness hit. Um, but the year that I was in France, my first year when I won the championship, it was just, when we went into the playoffs, we had to play as well first. And then it was like we lost the first game. So it was like, ah, hey, you know, we might be going home. So then we ended up winning the next two. We had to go into as well, win that game on the road. Then we came back and won at home and advanced to the next round. Then we had to play Strasburg. And it was like if you looked at the – you looked at our side of the bracket, we literally had the hardest role possible. So then we had Strasburg next round, had to play them. Similar situation. Like, I think we lost the first game. Then we had to win, like, the next two or something like that. And we were close to losing in Strasburg. But Chris Lofton went off. with crazy. He had, like, 30 oh, something. I remember that. Like, <laughs> put us on his back and just started carrying us, bro. He hitting, like, some of the toughest shots I've ever seen somebody hit. But it's like, for Chris Lofton, that's nothing. Like, he's done that so many times before. So then we ended up winning that game. And we advanced to the finals. And we got to play Monaco. And, you know what I'm saying, that was a tough one. I went to – I can't remember whether the series was three or five. I think it was five. Ended up going to five games or whatever. And we ended up having to win the whole thing on the road in Monaco. And we was two – we was a, a last-second shot. Uh, Paul Lacombe missing it. We won last-second shot from, you know what I'm saying, us being on the floor and crying and stuff and instead – of us crying, like, disappointed, frustrated tears. We was crying like tears of happiness and stuff because we took the hardest road possible and then we ended up winning the chip. So that was probably my my best memory, like, being overseas. Because it was just, like, with everything we raced with that year, we were still able to, like, Le Mans, we went, went up against, like, Asheville, which is, like, the EuroLeague club, you know what I'm saying, team with all the money. Went up against Strasbourg, went up against Monaco and was able to get the chip. And then, like, uh, I was talking about this to somebody yesterday. Like, the time that I played in Ephesus, where I was there with Jamar Gordon, he was, like, my first true vet that I had. Like, going into that situation and playing with him and that FS team that year, 
for those two months that I was here, there was probably my favorite basketball time because it was like it didn't matter who did what. Like, nobody cared who scored the points. Nobody cared about, you know what I'm saying, who did this. They just wanted to play basketball. So it was like the ball just moved, like Golden State. Like, all right, he drove, he kicked it, he wide open, he could shoot it, but now he's going to swing it to the next man because he more open. Then somebody closing out of him, he's going to swing it to the next man, he's going to drive it and just kick it to somebody to where, the, you know what I'm saying, the balls move so much, the last guy that finally gets the ball and gets the shot. It's just butt naked open. Like, that was just how they played. And it was just so fun, like, being in a situation because I'd never been in a situation like that. And then, like, me being who I am, jumping high, you know what I'm saying, flying high, they trying to throw me lobs. Every chance they get, they try, you know what I'm saying, throwing them any way they can, no looks, all kind of stuff. So, for me to go in that situation, like, that was a real memorable moment for me, too. And it's unfortunate because I haven't been on many teams that played the game like that. Uh, since then, so you know what I'm saying. Those are my my memorable moments. Uh, got a lot of teammates that I I met over the years. I still rock with most of them. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate y'all choosing me as a guest that y'all wanted to have on y'all podcast. Uh, I appreciate y'all inviting me on here, and I just appreciate y'all listening to my story. No doubt, no doubt, man, no doubt. Appreciate you coming on. I gotta say too. One of the most memorable things that I have, especially from France, but overseas, is I don't, I don't know if I had met you in person at the time, but I remember we played y'all. We came to Le Mans that year, 2019. And I remember just stopping in the middle of warm-ups, and I just I was watching you dunk because I was like, I in my on God, I don't know if anybody ever for people who haven't seen you play, I've never seen nobody in my life dunk like you dunk. So we got I gotta I gotta show you that love. I was over, you was doing some. East Bay in warm-ups, head at the rim. Like, I'm over here like, this shit don't make no sense. And then I went and stood next to you, and you my height. So I'm like, damn, you might have a couple inches on me. Nah, I'm about to say, how long now? You know we, we ain't the same height, brother. I ain't even feel like you're out of the people like that. You know we ain't the same height, brother. But... <laughs> nah, 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 it's man. funny. Over the years, man, it's always like that. Like, I'll just be chilling in warm-ups. You know, I'm just down there playing, having fun. And I look up. And, like, people will literally be watching me in warm-ups because, you know, you yeah. see all the stuff on the videos and this and that, and it looks different. But it's like when you see it in person, people always tell me, like, there's nothing better than seeing it firsthand in person. So no, I totally understand, that, bro. Man, that shit different. But, no, nah, man, love. Appreciate you coming on. Uh, you know, hopefully we have to have you on again down the road. And, uh, like I said, it's all love. Appreciate it, my boy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.